Assalamu alaikum. Dr. Hatim, how are you? Very good. How are you, Suhail? I'm doing very well. And uh, so today, you know, I have, um, you know, my, my first guest for Financial Network TV, where we want to share some really exciting, inspiring, innovative people from around the world. And it's a real privilege and honor to have uh, Dr. Hatim, who's not only one of the best innovators that I know, but has been a, a mentor, kind of like a father figure to me. Um, I've known uh, Hatim, I think, for over 30 years. You know, we, we used to, uh, Hatim used to actually be a, a teacher and uh, kind of a, a guide to me. And, and this is going back when I was, uh, I think, 10 or 12. And, and Hatim, you may remember better. And uh, yes. you, know, Hatim, you know, has seen me literally grow up from a, a kid and a teenager uh, to a uh, nice, uh, you know, mature young man. Distinguished. 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 Yes. And, uh, yes. So I have them a welcome uh, to the Financial Network uh, TV podcast and, and the video here. And uh, we look forward to um, you know, getting your insights and your inspiration and uh, learning from your experiences. Thank and, you for having uh, me. Uh, so without further ado, Hatem, you know, give us um, a brief um, introduction in terms of uh, what you do and um, and your background, and then we'll get into some specifics and, and cover the past 30 years, um, uh, essentially, and how you've been a, an innovator in the telecom wireless space. Well, again, thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm an Egyptian uh, by birth, uh, Canadian by uh, immigration. Um, I uh, studied electronics and uh, communications in Cairo University in Egypt and graduated in 79. Did, uh, then did some uh, mathematics work. Uh, I was, uh, you know, towards a, a Bachelor of uh, Mathematics in, in Champs University. Uh, then I did a Master's and a PhD in Physics from Calgary University. I did a little stunt of work in the oil industry with Schlumberger. And, uh, you know, my PhD in physics was in electromagnetics. So you put electromagnetics with communications and you get wireless communications. Yes. So that's my educational background. Yes. And, uh, and I think one of the most remarkable things is, uh, you know, the kind of the whole invention of wireless and Wi-Fi as we know it. And, and very few people, and, and I think you don't get the credit, you and, uh, you know, Dr. Patosh for, you know, the work that you did on wireless technology, and and you essentially are the co-inventor of Wi-Fi as we know it today. Uh, give us a little bit of a background on that and how that came about. And um... Yeah, uh, I mean, just going to that we don't get credit, it, we didn't just invent Wi-Fi, the high-speed Wi-Fi we use, we actually invented all high-speed mobile wireless communications. So you know, of course, not alone, you know, a lot of people contributed, but there are cornerstone patents that solve fundamental problems that without them, there would have been no high speed communications. And that's the role of our two patents, the WFDM patent and the multicode patent. Uh, in any case, the WFDM is the foundation technology for the high speed Wi Fi, the, uh, the, uh, WiMAX technology, and then the uh, LTE, the, the high speed download in LTE, as well as, uh, you know, all the speed in 5G. That all is based on the OFDM technology. The multi-code was uh, responsible for the speed in 3G from, from 2G to 3G, the speed was because of the uh, multi-code patent. So, you know, that's uh, our contributions. Uh, how it came about is uh, I started working for TELUS, a phone company in Alberta, and they wanted me to define for them which is the best 2G technology. Um, 1G was just an FM radio. If you had an FM scanner, you could hear, you know, the, chat, the, the, the calls. Um, 2G was the first digital technology. So we studied and, I, you know, I had moved away from communications for a while. So I asked TELUS to allow me to give a contract to my friend and partner, Dr. Michel Fatouche. And together we studied this technology and uh, we locked out phenomenally because uh, TELUS at that time bought uh, Novatel, which was the biggest uh, cellular manufacturer in the world at the time. Yeah. So we started doing the same project for uh, Novatel as well as TELUS. So we had suddenly 24 uh, PhDs in communications working with us. 
So, you know, it became a, a powerhouse. And we studied and uh, concluded that GSM, it was the best technology, but it wasn't available at the time. And we recommended IS-54, which was available to use immediately if they wanted to be first. Right. And we wrote at the end of the report that all these technologies were bad because we, um, Michelle and I, recognized that once the users tasted high speed, you know, they, they got digital communications and they got speeds up to 250 kilobits per second, they are not get, going to get enough, you know. So we, get, we recognize that once you give people a little bit of speed, they will never be satiated with right. speed. So we, um, uh, you know, recommended other technologies and, you know, back then they were in a rush and other reasons, they, they refused. So Michelle and I set out to develop this WFDM technology that solved uh, basic fundamental problems, like I said, in, com in high speed communications. And uh, we filed a patent in uh, 92. We invented the technology in 91. Uh, just so people get an idea, when we used to send those patent documents to each other over the internet, we used to send them at 300 to 1200 bits per second. Wow. You know, the, 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 the foundation that was talking about 100 yes. megabits per second yes, yes. was moving at 300 wow. bits per second. Wow. And this is back in 1992, you know, before people even had the concept of digital communications or, or wireless and, uh, uh, and, and this, essentially the foundation for the digital revolution. Absolutely. We, uh, back then, uh, that 300 bits per second was achieved by what's called data over voice. The data used to be converted to, to voice sounds, you know, like, uh, you know, the, the modem sounds. Yes, yes. And uh, that was data over voice. We literally, uh, you know, had to plug in the, hand, the, the handset into, okay. uh, you know, two rubber thingies and, you know, it, it's a voice wow. communication. We recognize that everything is going to be over data, voice over data, video over data, everything over data. We recognize that and we defined at the time personal communications as communications between anybody and anything, anywhere, at any time. We still haven't achieved that goal fully because IoT is part of it and you know, all other concepts in uh, personal communications are, are part of it. Yes. Okay, no, and this is back in 1992, and that led to the formation of Wildland, uh, your first uh, company, and, and the company that uh, eventually went uh, public uh, was a huge uh, success story. It was, a, uh, I think, one of the, the TSX uh, uh, best performing companies. Give us a little bit of an overview. I think, uh, so in 1992, uh, Wildland was incorporated, I, I believe, as you got, I registered these patents. Um, and then in 1999, if I recall correctly, Wildland went public. 1998, yeah. 1998, so about five years later. And, and this is, of course, during the dot-com uh, boom. Uh, and, and I was still in, in university, I think, 98, third year. And uh, tell us about that experience. And uh, because uh, the numbers and how Wildland performed during the, that period was phenomenal. What we tried to do was, of course, you know, at the time I, I was a researcher and, uh, you know, uh, uh, this was, um, the, the OFDM was our third patent, I believe, um, you know, so, you know, uh, we had an energy of uh, inventing and, uh, you know, innovation. Um, so we tried to sell the patent idea and we sent letters to a lot of companies and, and that didn't go far, you know, uh, Apple didn't want to sign an NDA, uh, Siemens signed an NDA and sent someone to review and AT&T signed an NDA and uh, sent it to a company to do uh, due diligence on it. Um, but really that didn't move far. Uh, someone came to us and said, you're doing this the wrong way. You should be starting a company, building a, a prototype and starting to sell, showing people that this is a real thing and then you can sell it. Um, and, and we liked that idea and we said, okay, we'll, uh, he said, just give me a year of your life and uh, we'll do something big then. And uh, we agreed and we started working with him and, uh, you know, uh, took about uh, 10 months from, we, we started work in uh, January of uh, 93 in Wylan. And uh, in October of 93, we did a demo of our technology in uh, uh, 
NetWorld uh, conference, uh, you know, in uh, Dallas, and uh, that was a you know a very big success. We had every big company, uh, Microsoft, Intel, came and saw the demo. Uh, some in our offices afterwards, and uh, they all agreed that this is the future. But they agreed it needed to be miniaturized into the you know PCMCIA card back then. And we agreed and we started the, you know, making rounds and rounds of uh, miniaturization until 1997 when it became the foundation of the uh, proposals for the high speed Wi-Fi in the IEEE. And uh, at that time uh, we recognized you know, it's time to take the company public. Uh, we had, uh, you know, were close to profitability at the time and we uh, took the company public in 98 and uh, led uh, from the Canadian point of view, the boom of 2000. And uh, we actually incorporated another company called Cellock in uh, 95. And that company went public first in 97. Cellock was in the business of locating cellular phones yes. without GPS or anything else, it was just with the infrastructure of the cellular company. And we used to be able to locate the phone to within one and a half meters, which was phenomenal. Um, we use something called we use something called super resolution uh, to do that, and basically we took those two companies public. And in 2000, they were number one and number two performers, the top two performance performers on the Toronto Stock Exchange in Canada. Wow, no, that's impressive. And I recall, I think uh, Wildland, um, because uh, Wildland is actually really uh, special because it was the first IPO I participated in and uh you know and i recall during the peak it went up to like 94 dollars i think or 98 it was just shy of 100 uh during That's right, peak. and I think 94 yeah or, eight, 94, or 92 i don't remember 92, yeah. something like that and and at that point uh, you know i remember nortel and and even Sellock, i think went up to 40 dollars uh, 84 84 oh, did so. it go up to 84 oh my god yeah uh that's uh, because I, I wasn't too active in Cellock. I was quite an active uh, yeah. investor in the trader in Wyland um, because it, there were just only a handful of tech companies uh, during that time in Canada, Nortel, Wyland, um, uh, Mitel, you know, so just yeah. uh, we could literally name them. Uh, yeah. And it was uh, quite a remarkable pe well, period. Now, after the, the, the dot com and how much did uh, capital did you raise, uh, Dr. Hatham, in uh, the IPO, if you recall? No, the, the IPO of uh, Cellock was, I think, like a million dollars only. And uh, Cellock was a better performer uh, by numbers because by numbers. The, the IPO was at 40 cents and it went up to $84. So yes. it went up over 200 times. And uh, some people bought, uh, you know, <laughs> don't want to yes, talk it's... about too much about <laughs> this, yes. shares at less than a cent at that some is. point. Yes, so these uh, people made phenomenal amounts exactly. of money, uh, uh, phenomenal returns. Yes. Uh, while then uh, the, the lowest people bought that was 50 cents and it went up yes. to $92. So, but the, it went public at 250. We raised $10 million, I believe, for Wyland when we went public. We raised 50 million uh, or 15 million after that, then 50 million. And uh, we raised, I think, in total about 300 million for Wyland over the years. And uh, for Cellock, um, probably about a hundred million. Okay, and uh, no, which is uh, and how did it feel like um, you know at that time? Uh, I think um, you know I remember you were featured in, in a lot of local media. You were named as one of the, the top um, uh, Canadians at McLean's Magazine, uh, and um, and you were the CEO of uh, a multi-billion-dollar company at that point, and and it happened very quickly. Um, uh, in a relatively short period of time. Uh, from the, uh, what are some of the kind of the lessons perhaps you could share with our guests and, and other innovators that are, you know, thinking of, you know, doing an IPO and uh, um, some words of wisdom from that experience and... Uh... The most important thing is don't let your own success fool you, you know. Uh, don't get drunk on your own, you know, drinks you know okay. so uh, basically you know uh, don't look back you know always look forward you've got goals to achieve don't let the successes of the past stop you from achieving the goals in the future and always set harder goals i mean one of my uh, you know sort of uh, problems at YLAN was, uh, you know, we had the goal of making this a standard. Well, it became a standard. We had the goal of, uh, you know, 
pushing for something like 4G. We pushed for 4G and it was starting. So, you know, we had big goals, but we achieved them. So, you know, we, we should have had bigger goals even. Yes, yes. And, uh, and, uh, and, and you've seen the evolution of telecom and wireless from literally 1G, 2G to 3G and, and even 4G, which is something that you were working on back in uh, the early 2000s or late 1990s. I, I give a little bit of a background on wireless technology because most people aren't really, you know, they use the, the phones and devices um, and we take 4G. I, I recall, you know, we, I started using um, uh, 4G about three years ago, right when we upgraded the phones. And, uh, uh, and yes, obviously you notice a big performance boost. Uh, and now coverage is pretty much, there's no issue with coverage. And now we're getting into 5G. Uh, but, you know, in terms of the past 20 years, and then what I want to do is, um, you know, you've been involved pretty much at each uh, stage of the evolution of the wireless uh, sec uh, sector. Uh, give us a little bit of background, Dr. Hatham. And, and, uh, and then in the, in the second part, what I'd like to do is really go into some of the great work that you're doing with 6G. Uh, and innovation and mesh technology. Great. Now, the, the, you know, let's take communications is, uh, uh, you know, I used to call them like in circles. So the smallest circle, the one closest to you is what, what one would call personal networks, you know, like, uh, and they would include your Bluetooth, you know, near field communications devices and so on. Then you have a, a local area network and that's uh, your Wi-Fi and, and things like that. And then you have a wide area network. These are three distinct networks you're in. Unfortunately, the worst of them to this day are the very near ones, the, the personal ones. Bluetooth is not 100%. Very often you put uh, the headphones on and it, doesn't, it does not connect, you know. Uh, and, it, and it's a, you know, a limitation of the technology. So it uses a, a form of OFDM, but the, the protocol is not as solid as the Wi-Fi protocol. Um, so, you know, we, we need some work on that still, but, uh, you know, thinking about it this way, that you have the personal network, the local network, the wide area network. The wide area network, if we take it from that side, is based on the mobile uh, technologies, the mobile uh, technologies that started, like I said, from just regular FM to uh, GSM to now, you know, the 3G and 4G. The... Uh, uh, you know, basically we had, like we said, you know, the, the industry, uh, like I said before, you know, uh, uh, 2G peaked at about 250 kilobits per second and people very quickly recognized that's a major limitation. So they started looking at what they would call a 3G. Now, 3G officially is the last high speed technology, meaning by that we had uh, analog, not digital. Right. We had digital, and then we had high speed. There was nothing past high speed. So uh, we came and uh, recognized that even 3G has its speed limitation with the technologies they were using. So we wanted to use OFDM, like Wi-Fi, in a Wi-Fi-like technology. We started something called the OFDM Forum to harmonize OFDM technologies in use so that you can use the same designs, the same chipsets, in more than one technology. So you use it in the personal, the local, and the wide area networks. And basically we, we, we pushed for that. And we, uh, based on the OFDM forum, uh, recommended the, the what's called the WiMAX technology uh, or the uh, for wide area networks yes. and it was high speed. Uh, but we had a vision. Our vision was outdoors you use WiMAX, which is a variation of Wi-Fi and indoors you use Wi-Fi. You know, as soon as you, you go indoors, you either suffer with using the WiMAX from outdoors to indoors, or you use the Wi-Fi indoors. And, you know, it, it would have been a, a, com a complementarity of networks. Uh, and the reason we wanted that is it would have been very inexpensive. WiMAX is a, relatively speaking, very inexpensive technology. Uh, and we formed the WiMAX Forum with Nokia and Ensemble and two other companies. Uh, and uh, we, we led it, uh, the WiMAX Forum, for uh, about three years, from 2002 to 2005. And we uh, got a lot of companies to join through, you know, advertising and, and uh, promoting the, 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 
the, the forum. And eventually, you know, it became a standard and people started accepting the term 4G, you know, so the, Officially, there is no 4G, but because the, the, the group that is responsible to issue now the 4G and 5G and 6G standard is called the 3G Partnership Project. So 3G okay. is the last official, you know, technology or the last official speed. But in any case, so we convinced people to go for 4G and uh, we used to tell them a very funny thing. You can go to 4G in 2002 and 2003 using WiMAX or wait for the long-term evolution of the cellular network, which is a bad thing. Yeah. They shortened long-term evolution to LTE and it became the winner and everybody oh. loves it and is proud he's using LTE. He does not understand he used <laughs> an inferior technology, you know, to, okay. to, to build the networks. Eventually then we went on to um, you know, I, I left the communications arena because uh, the company we formed, Wyland, converted itself in 2006 to be a patent enforcement company because no one paid us, uh, or very few companies paid us uh, amicably, you know, our uh, dues. Uh, so we had to sue companies, and I didn't want to be uh, the CEO or the chairman of a company that sues other companies. And yes. uh, I stepped out of the communications industry. I was only a, a, a a witness in that patent case. Right. So I stayed away till 2015. I was watching the 5G and, you know, uh, there, there are minor issues with the 5G. Um, the, there are two 5G technologies or two 5G frequencies, one at the low end, which is about six gigahertz. That is not very different than the uh, 5.8 gigahertz that Wi-Fi, the, high, the yeah. higher end of the Wi-Fi works at. Yeah. So we know that that frequency very well. The second uh, frequency that's planning to use is around 58 gigahertz. Wow. And that's very close to the absorption peak of oxygen. Okay. We, don't, uh, we didn't study that frequency too much. Okay. So we need to uh, be careful a bit more okay. with that side of things until we know that frequency much more. Absolutely. And, and I think that's some of the um, uh, concerns and there's, uh, you know, various organizations, people that are, you know, raising alarms about the safety of 5G. And, and when they're, so that is because, you know, and, and again, I think, you know, some have been labeled as um, um, conspiracy theorists, you know, that this is a government, uh, you know, government plot and, and others are just being cautious. Where do you sit in terms of the safety uh, aspects of 5G at, you know, 50, is it 58 gigahertz? Uh, yeah. You know, which is... Uh, uh, at the high end, I say we just need to be a little bit more careful. You know, I'm not saying at all, I'm not an alarmist and I'm not saying, you know, uh, it's bad. No, I'm saying we just needed more tests, especially about the, the, the peak of the oxygen. Oxygen is not just vital, is life, you know. Yeah. So, you know, we can't be uh, heating oxygen before we breathe it. We can't be heating oxygen by having a phone in our hands. Now, my bigger issue with the 5G at that frequency is that it is really meant for the autonomous cars and for the force uh, industrial revolution and, and, and all these things. You know, my, my issue is that is why do I, as an average user, pay for uh, such technologies? You know, like I will be the one carrying most of the burden for someone driving an autonomous car. Well, that's not fair. You know, uh, someone who buys an autonomous car should pay five times as much as me for, you know, the, 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 the infrastructure. Second, you know, the speeds that they're talking about, 30 gigabits per second, which mobile phone can handle that speed? Mm -hmm. yes. You know, our share of it, my share as a user will never be more than 700 megabits. And I'm saying, sorry, this never, I mean, you know, with yeah. our mobile technology yeah. of today, of yeah. course, in 10 years, we may need it, but yes. l let it come in 10 years then. Right, you know, right. Don't give okay. me 30 meg gigabits per second when my phone can only handle 700. Yes, no, that's a great point. And that's actually a, a great uh, kind of a, a closing into our part two, in which we're going to specifically talk about, you know, 5G and more importantly, 6G. 
and some of the technologies that you're working on, Dr. Hatham, to basically leapfrog, you know, from 4G to 6G. Um, but before we go into part two, um, you know, I want to take a couple of minutes, Dr. Hatham, and, uh, and uh, you know, get to know, uh, get the users to know you a little bit better. Uh, and I'm going to do a few rapid fire questions. We're going to do just five rapid fire questions. The, the top answer that comes to your mind, um, you know, please do um, share and, uh, and let's have a little bit of fun. Uh, so the first rapid fire question is, um, what's your favorite food? Your favorite food? Oh, it would be kebab. Kebab, all oh, right. That's uh, in line with my uh, favorite uh, food lineup. And um, what's your favorite um, country to visit? Gee, I love the whole world. Uh, every country has its, its beauty. Okay. So no That's country very comes nice to political quite, uh, answer, but uh, we'll take it. And uh, uh, what is uh, the best uh, business advice that you've ever received? Um, well, actually, it, it is very simple. But, uh, you know, when I started Wildland, someone told me, uh, with the employees, be very careful. Once a gift, twice a habit, three times a right. So be very careful how you deal with the employees and yes. you know what you set up and, and so on. And we set up a very productive company with that advice. Perfect. No, no, that's great uh, advice. And, um, and, and what's your um, uh, thoughts on the US elections, Trump or Biden? Well, who, could, who, who would have expected Trump to win the first ones? <laughs> so you're thinking Trump could still do it again. He could pull a rabbit. <laughs> this guy can, yes, can pull <laughs> rabbits out of nowhere. <laughs> and, uh, and in terms of the trade war and what's happening with the U.S. and, and China, uh, in 10 years, who do you think is going to be the dominant uh, technology player in the world? I don't know why you're asking about 10 years. I think in two yeah, years, uh, Ch China is already ahead of the U.S. by it far. Uh, okay. Already now, you know, already now. Uh, and that's the whole reason for the trade war. It's uh, losing it's status. Out. You know, the uh, Apple, which is the, the, the cream of uh, products in the U.S., is not number one anymore. Yes. So... You know. All right. No, thank you so much, Dr. Hatam. And we will come to part two in a, in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much.